Time loops have a very specific appeal for me in the opportunities they give a story to explore so much in such a limited space. They imagine worlds and histories that could have been on a grand and inconsequential scale. They experiment and play with every variable of daily life, for better and for worse. They present their characters with every chance to do anything right and wrong just to see what could happen. And while arguing that it's been overlooked is probably a bit presumptuous, it's not something I've seen discussed in detail. So today, I want to do just that, and break down what I think makes this particular storytelling trope so interesting. But to do that, I'm gonna need to start over. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me in the way they punish those caught in them. It's not a new concept, as it can be seen in stories as old as the Greek myth of the timeless cycles imposed on Sisyphus, who, for his crimes of deceit in life, was sentenced in death to eternally push a boulder up a hill that, for one reason or another, would never reach its peak. And that cyclical structure is carried over into many time loop stories, where this similarly cyclical universal roadblock forces deeply flawed characters to confront their shitty behaviour, and whose only escape comes from a genuine effort to be better people. Or, put more bluntly, their stories that tell their characters, You need to stop being such a... Cunt. And my favourite example of this is Russian Doll, specifically because of the empathy with which it does so. Following a middle-aged programmer called Nadia and an obsessive young man called Alan, as they find their lives intertwined when everything around them starts to reset every time they die, the series is quick to show how its deuteragonist respective assholeish tendencies manifest in their own unique ways. Whether it be Nadia's do-whatever-I-want mentality leading to her tearing other people's relationships to shreds. I blew up my life, and that's not on you, but if you could acknowledge that it happened, that would be great. Or how Alan's need for control leaves those around him walking on eggshells out of fear of setting him off. Somebody tell you? That you are gonna break up with me. No. No, you did. Stop playing these mind games. What is the point of all this? To humiliate me? To make me feel bad? Yes! But it's something they both seem unaware of. Oh. I thought it was because you were pissing him off. And uh, sexualizing self-hatred is the hallmark of any relationship that begins with extramarital infidelity. You skipped out on meeting his daughter and you broke up his marriage. For as much as it emphasizes the destructive nature of their behavior, the series is also keenly aware that it isn't something they do on purpose, but simply from a lack of awareness that stems from their respective emotional hang-ups, ones that are so heavy they can't lift their head to see what's going on around them, both in Nadia's childhood trauma leaving her feeling guilty for just being alive, and Alan's self-loathing driving him to a breaking point to prove he's not a failure, and being so absorbed in their own issues they ended up completely missing each other when they needed it most effectively leaving the other for dead and triggering their cyclical predicament. We met each other that first night that we died. I saw you at the deli that night with Farah. No, I don't remember that. Oh, of course you don't. You were fucked up beyond repair. But I saw you. I even thought about helping you. But I decided to fuck with these Wall Street guys instead. But if I hadn't, I could have stopped you from killing yourself. And if I hadn't gotten so drunk, I could have stopped you from getting hit by that car. And that is where things went side. So the loop started because we didn't help the other person. I think so. I knew we were being punished. More than being a punitive measure, Russian Dolls' time loops act as a wake-up call for its characters, with a story that recognizes their pain and guides them to a better path by appealing to their humanity. But it's not an easy one to walk for either of them. It not only confronts them with their own less than stellar character, but also with the pain and trauma that fed into it in the first place. And it's a lot of buried feelings for them to dig up and unpack that they just don't have the mental wherewithal to deal. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me in the way they let those caught in them punish themselves. They let their characters turn back the clocks and return to a time when, for them, the world was better, to reminisce on what once was, and more importantly, to make sure it stays that way. And it's what, for me, defines Puella Magi Medica Magica. Set in a world where monstrous embodiments of despair known as witches feed on human misery and magical girls fight them in secret to protect the world from their hunger with the power of soul gems they gain from a contract with the alien Kube, it follows Madoka and Sayaka, who, after accidentally stumbling into a witch's domain, slowly learn all the ins and outs of magical girl life, for better and for worse. It's a series that, despite the colourful look, puts a darker spin on the magical girl premise, particularly in its use of time loops. On a literal level, it reveals that Homura, who throughout the show was depicted as an antagonistic enigma even to the seemingly all-knowing Kyubei, is in a self-imposed time loop after wishing to save Madoka, 
who in her original timeline was her best friend and died fighting a witch, by preventing her from becoming a magical girl in the first place. But on a metaphorical level, the very nature of being a magical girl is itself cyclical, particularly for Sayaka, who becomes one to help the boy she loves recover from an accident that destroyed his musical talents, and finds herself endlessly fighting witches over and over and over again to save the world. Becoming a magical girl allows these characters to take on the responsibility of enduring these loops to save those they care about by, in some way, shape, or form, trying to return them to a time before their respective tragedies. But it also shows how pointless this can be. It's eventually revealed that in order to create a soul gem, Kyube separates a girl's soul from their body, allowing them to take and do much more damage in a fight, but turning their body into a literal husk as a result, a revelation that leaves Sayaka distraught. <laughs> And what's more, if that soul gem gets too corrupted from using said magic, it'll shatter into a grief seed and turn them into a witch. A sad reality that negates what little good their magical girl antics are able to do. It creates a literal cycle where witches are defeated by magical girls, who eventually become witches themselves, who need to be defeated by other magical girls, and so on ad nauseum. And for Homura specifically, with each loop she goes through, things only get worse. Since, as a result of her wish, Madoka's been positioned at the center of Homura's many timelines, thus creating in her the potential to become the world's most powerful magical girl, and its most powerful witch, which only grows with every loop. Despite their good intentions, their efforts to make things right don't amount to much, and in some cases only make things worse, even on the smallest of scales. Their attempts to make things right are meaningless. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me, in the way they let us punish ourselves. Masochistic as it sounds, there is something kind of fun about having effectively infinite chances to get something right. And while I could point to games specifically built around time loop mechanics to make this point, it's something I think is almost inherent to the very nature of video games as a medium. Also, this video wasn't originally meant to be time loop focused, but I'm not sure how algorithm friendly the overlooked art of cyclical storytelling structures would have been, so... Anyway, most games are built around the idea of respawning, which, though not a literal time loop, still mimics its structure, by resetting a player to a predetermined point in time and in world after some kind of failure. Some studios have built a brand out of their games' as slim margin for error. There's an entire genre of games known as roguelike, specifically dedicated to this sort of cyclical experience. By pushing players through randomized gauntlets of gameplay and challenging them to reach the end with one perfect run, or just to see how far they can get. Some have even gotten meta with the concept, turning the tables on our preconceptions of what's now considered standard game design to show how deeply disturbing the idea of resetting a world over and over again just to get a desirable outcome can really be. Whether it be you ripping your way through hundreds of innocent characters just to see what'll happen, or in a character doing that to everyone else just to get their perfect ending with you. The respawn loop most games are built around are fun to play through because of the sense of progression they create, by giving players direct feedback on their mistakes and giving them an almost immediate opportunity to try again, with tangible results that make the struggle that much more rewarding. But it's not always an enjoyable experience, as I found myself stumbling into plenty of games that are just too much. The one that always sticks out in my mind is Celeste, a 2D platformer whose struggle to deal with its precision platforming reflects the struggle of its main character to cope with her mental health struggles, and it's a genuinely fantastic game I consider to be one of my favourites of all time. But ironically, it also induces genuine anxiety in me at the thought of returning to, 
Despite its optimistic ending telling the player that any mountain, whether literal or metaphorical, can be climbed by accepting the struggle that'll come with it and climbing on anyway, that climb is still an absolute nightmare to deal with. And even more ironically, for me anyway, I don't think it's fully reflective of the experience of dealing with anxiety and depression. Cause it's never just one thing to overcome. There's always another mountain to climb. There's always another fucking mountain. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me, and the way they make those caught in them suffer through their endless cycles. The monotony that comes with them is something that can stand in for any number of seemingly endless woes of daily life, whether literal or subtextual, and on scales both personal and existential. And it's something I think is best encapsulated by two stories in particular, which tackle the idea from polar opposite angles. 12.01pm, a short film about Myron Castleman, a New York City executive caught in an hour-long time loop. And All You Need Is Kill, a manga that follows rookie soldier Keiji Kiria an elite fighter Rita Vertaski, as they fight through hordes of alien invaders to survive long enough to escape their literal death loop. While very different stories, I think they both end up hitting on the same issue with their respective loops, in the isolation that comes from their monotony. In the latter, Keiji and Rita find themselves lost both in life, as Keiji runs away from his problems and Rita has nothing left after an attack on her hometown, and in a seemingly endless war where their military's only response to the unending alien invasion is to keep fighting. While they both learn to become efficient fighters through their loops, it also pushes them away from their comrades, as the memories of their countless battles and casualties haunt them, and leaves them hesitant to connect with anyone, knowing it'll eventually amount to nothing, either because because of their loop or the nature of war itself. In the former, meanwhile, Myron embodies the archetypal struggle of an office worker, dreaming of making it big in his company while stuck in a rut of tedious busywork. They may be a big deal, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm just one of the little people. Hey, don't knock it. I mean, it's us little people who run these joints, right? It's not a joint I'd particularly care to run, or even work for, for that matter. So why the hell do you work there? beats me. It seemed like a good idea 23 years ago. He wants to break away from corporate life, but no matter what he tries, whether it be talking to a woman he's interested in, lashing out at the world, or helping a homeless man, it doesn't do anything to change the unending cycle his days have become. In both stories, the endlessness of their loops leaves their characters feeling hopeless and disconnected from the world around them, knowing no one would understand their plight or even take it seriously. And what makes it worse is that in both cases, there's no real way out of it. Even after escaping her first battle, Rita is pushed into countless more to fight the alien forces, over and over and over again, pulling her into a more metaphorical cycle of combat against an enemy that just doesn't stop. The only way she's able to get out of it is through death. But that doesn't end the loop, it simply shifts it onto Keiji instead. And Myron's attempt to end his loop, even through suicide, proved to be useless, as he still finds himself sent back to square one when the clock strikes noon. It just never ends. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me, and the way their cyclical suffering reflects their characters' obsessions. The endless journeys time loop stories put their characters through, I think in a lot of ways embody the experience of addiction, which leaves those suffering through them stuck in their own endless cycle of chasing the highs and comforts their respective obsessions can bring. And I think it's clear to see in The Dark Tower, a series of weird western dark fantasy novels that follow Roland Deschamps, the last of the gunslingers, wandering across a vast and twisted world filled with all kinds of horrifying oddities as he and his band of travelers out of time search for its titular tower. Almost every character throughout the series struggles with some kind of addiction or obsession, whether it be as on the nose as Eddie Dean's initial desperation for heroin, or Calvin Tower's dedication to his collection of rare books, to Mia's willingness to do anything to become a mother or the Red King's paranoid grabs for power, and even Roland's own quest for the Dark Tower itself. Everyone has their own tower to chase, and while I don't mean to psychoanalyze here, knowing the substance abuse struggles its author Stephen King had, I wouldn't be surprised to learn, even if only subconsciously, his experience had an influence on these true lines of the narrative. And what makes it click for me is how it all comes to an end. When, after everything's said and done, after all the death and destruction he's witnessed by his own hands or by others, and as a lifetime of work is about to pay off as Roland finally reaches the top of his beloved tower, rather than be relieved, he is instead horrified by what he finds. 
He saw and understood at once, the knowledge falling upon him in a hammer blow, hot as the sun of the desert that was the apotheosis of all deserts. How many times had he climbed these stairs only to find himself peeled back, curved back, turned back? Not to the beginning when things might have been changed and time's curse lifted, but to that moment in the Mohane Desert, when he had finally understood that his thoughtless, questionless quest would ultimately succeed. How many times had he travelled a loop like the one in the clip that had once pinched off his navel, his own Tet Ka Kangan? How many times would he travel it? Oh no, he screamed. Oh please, not again. Have pity. Have mercy! The hands pulled him forward regardless. The hands of the tower knew no mercy. They were the hands of Gan, the hands of Ka, and they knew no mercy. He smelled alkali, bitter as tears. The desert beyond the door, white, blinding, waterless, without feature save for the faint, cloudy haze of the mountains which sketched themselves on the horizon. The smell beneath the alkali was that of the devil grass which brought sweet dreams, nightmares, death. Not for you, gunslinger. He made one final effort to draw back. Hopeless. Ka was stronger. Roland of Gilead walked through the last door. The one he always sought. The one he always found. It closed gently behind him. For a moment he had felt he was somewhere else. In the tower itself, mayhap. But of course the desert was tricky and full of mirages. The dark tower still lay thousands of wheels ahead. That sense of having climbed many stairs and looked into many rooms where many faces had looked back at him was already fading. After reaching such a high, Roland is knocked right back down to Earth and left to wander after the tower once more. And I think the metaphor it's trying to get across is painfully obvious. That no matter how close you get and how many times you get it, what highs you'll get from your obsessions will never satisfy you in the end. It'll just never be enough. Time loops have a very specific comfort for me in the way the suffering they create reflects my own experiences. I've always struggled with pretty intense anxiety. It's often overwhelming. But what makes it so hard is how often I feel like I end up stumbling back to square one while trying to deal with it. That what little progress I make in learning to manage never sticks or lasts and I have to start all over again when something goes wrong. It doesn't help that my anxiety often manifests in literal loops, where my brain's instinctive coping mechanism to deal with intrusive thoughts is to compulsively do certain things over and over and over and over and over that I know are fucking stupid and pointless, but are the only things that feel like they help until the thoughts subside. And it can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes to sometimes over an hour at a time. Anxiety has always been a cyclical problem for me. And I think it's part of why my brain latches on to these kinds of stories. Particularly ones like, to loop this back around to the start, Russian Doll. I touched on it a bit, but its character's internal turmoil seems directly tied to their cycles, leaving them stuck in an eternal emotional rut and unable to move beyond it. Something they're both painfully aware of, but are scared to actually deal with. Will you stop acting crazy? Oh my god, I am not crazy, okay? I am not crazy! You know, I hate it when people call me crazy. No, Please don't no, roll your eyes. No, no, no. You have no, I, no, I don't need to go to see a therapist. And, and no offense to you, but I, people thinking that I'm crazy is one of my biggest fears. It's not until they meet someone who understands what they're going through that they're able to open up about it. That doesn't mean it's easy for either of them. I mean, confronting the embodiment of her trauma literally kills Nadia. But it gives them some comfort in knowing there will be someone there to understand and catch them when they fall. What's wrong? I'm so fucking happy that you did not jump. You promise if I don't jump, I'll be happy. Oh, man. Absolutely not. But I can promise you that you'll not be alone. And fittingly, it's that same comfort that this show, that a lot of these shows and games and stories give me. That sense that there's someone out there who, on some level, gets it. That understands what I'm going through on a fundamental level. And while it is a deeply personal and subjective thing, it's still nice to have. Especially when things start to go wrong, because they often do. Time loop stories are miserable things, and it can be hard to understand why anyone would enjoy them. Especially someone like me, where they at best just remind me of my own misery. But for me, what was always a vague appeal became crystal clear after playing a game that, ironically, though cyclical, has no time loop. 
Hades. It's a roguelike where you play as Zagreus, the son of the titular god of the underworld, and fight your way through a literal hellscape to reach the mortal world and meet your long lost mother. Like all roguelikes, every time you die you're sent back to the start and have to try again. After dozens of hours of playtime on Switch, I finally managed to escape the underworld on my 40th run. With the Shield of Chaos and empowered by boons from Poseidon, Ares and Demeter, I walked out onto the snowy fields of ancient Greece and watched as Zagreus was finally able to connect with his mother for the first time in his life. But it didn't last long. The fates are cruel, Zagreus. You're bound to that place. The same as your father. So they would have us say goodbye. For now. My heart soars knowing you live. Then it breaks that our time together was so brief. No. I can... Come back. I can come back. Now that i found you, he... Maybe he'll just let me come back. The sticks shall take you then. Oh, Zagreus. Farewell, my son. Won't you come back to me? When you are able, please, come back. I shall be waiting here, however long it takes. However long it takes. After that, in every run I made, I managed to fight my way right up to Hades himself every time. And on my 45th, I beat him once again, this time with the Fists of Malphon, empowered by Hades, Aphrodite, and Athena. And working off a tip Rasputin mentioned in his video on game completion that's surprisingly effective. It's a far cry from how I started, when I could barely keep myself from stumbling into a trap with every other dash. And it's in that progress that I think the fundamental appeal of these looping stories lie. For as pessimistic as many of them can be, most of the time loop and generally cyclical stories I've experienced are defined by this kind of stubborn optimism. They show how making a mistake isn't the end of the world, that sometimes it's okay to let things go, that things can be different the next time around, that for as isolated as you may feel in your struggles, you're not the only one going through them, and you don't have to deal with it all on your own, and that no matter how bad things may seem, there's always a way to move forward, and beyond the things that hold you back. I think what makes time loop stories so appealing, at least for me, is the many different ways so many of them, intentionally or not, emphasize the same basic idea. That with enough time, enough chances, and enough patience, anyone can learn to not only be better, but to actively do better. It's a sentiment I can't help but appreciate, and that I think needs a little more discussion. It's like I said at the start of this video. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me in the opportunities they give a story to explore so much in such a limited space. They imagine worlds and histories that could have been on a grand and inconsequential scale. They experiment and play with every variable of daily life, for better and for worse. They present their characters with every chance to do anything right and wrong just to see what could happen. And while arguing that it's been overlooked is probably a bit presumptuous, it's not something I've seen discussed in detail. So today, I want to do just that, and break down what I think makes this particular storytelling trope so interesting. But to do that, I'm gonna need to start over. Time loops have a very specific appeal for me in the way they punish those caught in them. It's not a new concept, as it can be seen in stories as old as the Greek myth of the timeless cycles imposed on Sisyphus, who, for his crimes of deceit and life, was sentenced in death to eternally push a boulder up a hill that, for one reason or another, would never reach its peak. And that cyclical structure is carried over into many time loop stories, where this similarly cyclical universal roadblock forces deeply flawed characters to confront their shitty behavior, and whose only escape comes from a genuine effort to be better people. Or, put more bluntly, their stories that tell their characters, You need to stop being such a... Cunt. And my favourite example of this is Russian Doll, specifically because of the empathy with which it does so. Following a middle-aged programmer called Nadia and an obsessive young man called Alan, as they find their lives intertwined when everything...